The exhibition Seven Treasures, Japanese, Japanese Enamels, is a collection from the V&A that shows the development of the art of enamelling, mostly from the 19th century, from about 1840 onwards, but it does show earlier pieces as well. It shows how this craft developed in Japan to become one of the major exports uh, during, the, during the second half of, of the 19th century. It has a fascinating history. Prior to the 1600s, Japanese enamels were only used as small areas of decorative inlay on objects, such as sword fittings, uh, water droppers, architectural pieces, some of these going back to the 13th century. The pieces here don't date as early as that, but they show the techniques. And it shows different, shows different forms of enamelling, from simple inlay, called champlevé in French, um, we use a lot of French terms in enamelling, through to cloisonné enamelling, and then through to the extraordinary developments that happened in the second half of the 19th century. But strangely, it seems that the Japanese never made three-dimensional objects until about 1840, when a former samurai called Kajitsune Kichi, or so the story goes, found a piece of enamel, Chinese or Dutch, we're not sure, took it apart and worked out how it was actually made. And within a few years, he was actually making small three-dimensional objects. And a few years after that, he was actually appointed as official uh, in enamel maker to the regional warlord um, in the Nagoya area. Japan at this time was still ruled by the samurai. In fact, it was ruled by the samurai until 1868. And the samurai were the major patrons of most of the artists and craftsmen. But they were all living on stipends. They were no longer warriors. And so they had to find alternate ways to make a living. And so Kaji made his living out of making enamels, a craft that he applied himself to and really worked out how it all worked, how it all came together. And from that time, the 1840s, Nagoya in central western Japan became the centre of production for enamelling. But it soon spread out further into Kyoto, which is geographically not that far away, and to Tokyo and to other areas of Japan. But the samurai were um, finished as a ruling power in 1868. The emperor was, was restored to power. And in 1876, the samurai were actually abolished as a, as, as a clan. Japan was going through a rapid modernization process and was rejecting so much of its historical past. But at the same time, it was also um, displaying its works in international exhibitions. They were trying really hard to show that Japanese art and technology was as good as that in the West. And we in the West really admired the amount of work and effort that went into uh, producing a piece of Japanese enamel. It's a really meticulous process. You start with a copper body, you draw a design on it, you then flux it, you then start to inlay the enamels which are then fired at different temperatures and then polished down. And this process can be done multiple times, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. The earliest objects that were being produced were fairly small, but certainly by the 1880s, 1890s, what's known as the golden age of Japanese anomaly, there were some enormous pieces being produced. But we can see how the technique develops from the early enamels of the 1840s, 50s, 60s, which had a lot of wire work and were fairly matte in their, in their finish. The wire work was important because not only was it a decorative uh, part of the of, of the object concerned, but it also had a practical function because it stopped the enamels flowing into other parts of the body. So you create your piece, you flux it, you apply and then you polish and then you're left with the finished object. There are pieces in the exhibition that show these processes. Um, it doesn't show the whole process, but it shows examples of how that work um, can progress and does progress. Then we can start to look at uh, the development of enamels uh, pieces like those by Namikawa Yasuyuki, a Kyoto-based maker, who has the most exquisite wire work, um, tiny, tiny, tiny wires. If you look at an area of one square centimetre, the detail in there is, is really almost infinitesimal. You have to look at it through a magnifying glass to really appreciate it. Technology improves. The use and need of wires becomes negated and you start to have objects with large expanses of mirror, shiny enamels with no wires on them whatsoever. You have further developments by another uh, maker, Namikawa Sosuke, 
In fact, the, the two Namikawas were of such high quality, Namikawa Yasuyuki and Namikawa Sosuke, that in 1896 they were appointed as imperial craftsmen to the Emperor Meiji. Namikawa Sosuke developed a technique known as Musen, no wire enamelling. And in this process, the wires are actually removed before the firing, but the enamels are of such high quality that they don't actually flow into each other. Further developments were made by makers such as the Ando Company, where um, the enamels would deliberately flow into each other to create graded effects. And we can see many, many examples of these in, in the exhibition. The Ando Company were also responsible for a process known as moriage, which literally means piling up. Now, Japanese craftsmen, it seems to me, that if there's an easy way of doing it, they won't take that way. They'll take the more difficult way. With Moriyagi, the raised effect, where you have um, a, a design or a motif that is actually almost in three dimensions, could very easily be done by hammering out the copper body. But no, the Japanese do it by literally piling up and raising the enamels and polishing them. A very, very difficult technique indeed. Um, one that is really not being done today. And in fact, most of the craftsmanship that you can see in these exquisite objects is of such labour intensity that actually it's the, the, the craft is all but lost today. So we, we have a time capsule. One of the great skills of the Japanese craftsmen in enamels was to make one object look as though it's made from another type of material. And there are examples in the exhibition that show this. The beautiful blue and white vase, for example, that looks like a piece of Delftware. There are no wires visible at all, but it is in fact enamelling. Uh, it's not strictly speaking cloisonné because there are no cloisons. The wires have been removed prior to the firing process, but it has this very soft look like a piece of porcelain. One other special technique uh, that was developed by the Ando Company from about 1900 is what is called uh, plika jo, or in Japanese, shotai jippo. Uh, Ando had seen this type of uh, enamel wear at the Paris 1900 exhibition made by the, the French company Therma, uh, of Thesma. And his craftsman brought one of these pieces back, and like uh, Kajitune Kichi 40 years earlier, they took this apart and worked out how to make it. And it's a very, very special type of cloisonné enamel. You make your enamelling as you normally would, copper bowl, apply the wires, apply the um, enamels uh, into, into the wires, into, in, into the cloisons. But in this instance, on the inside of the bowl, there is no counter enamel. A counter enamel is normally needed to prevent the fluctuations in temperature. If you, if you imagine that the inside of the bowl is bare metal, the outside of the bowl is enamel in the firing process, the unenameled un side will heat up more quickly than the, than the enameled side. But in Plicajour, the piece is created, and then when it's finished, the outside is lacquered or varnished, and then the metal on the inside, the copper, is dissolved with acid. So you're left with, effectively, a piece of three-dimensional stained glass. And you can see this in the exhibition, beautifully lit from below, with the light shining through, exquisite objects. And in fact, this, this type of wear is still being made today by the Ando Company, who are the only uh, makers from the Golden Age who are still producing in Japan today.